thank you all uh, so much for coming out. Uh, I'm Eddie, uh, I'm an activist, friend of the film, and we're gonna do uh, a little bit of Q&A here at the end. And I'd like to start off by introducing uh, one of the directors, Georgia Archer, right here. Give her a Yes, yes. And, um, yes, yes, and our esteemed panelists, they will come down, uh, you guys can come down right now. And, um, and we're taping this, so. We're taping this, so look good. Popcorn, popcorn, very good. Um, so, uh, if the if the panelists would just give a 15 second intro, who you are, what what you're all about. Uh, my name is Pete Forsyth. Uh, I am a uh, Wikipedia contributor and consultant. I've been uh, an active uh, producer of content on Wikipedia for a long time, and I kind of think of the internet as the air I breathe and the water that I drink in the work that I do, which I like to think. Uh, is for the public good, and I would like that air and water to be pure and good. Lovely. I like that you looked at me when you said that. <laughs> pure and good. Because you're pure and good. <laughs> uh, my name is Josh Levy. I work at Free Press, which is a media reform organization. We had a couple of folks in the film uh, from our organization. I run the internet campaign there. Um, so a lot of these issues that we're talking about in this film are kind of my day-to-day -day work. Uh, yeah, Tom Woodley, I'm a filmmaker, a web series maker, and uh, so my particular interest in this is uh, you know, how does how does net neutrality issue impact art and impact filmmaking and uh, small business. We have a nascent business model and, and how is this going to effectively report? All right, give a round of applause. Yay! Um, so uh, I'll start things off. The question I asked uh, the panel at seven o'clock. So where is net neutrality at right now? Uh, and anyone, by all means, feel free to step forward. I will do it. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, there was a big vote uh, on something called a resolution of disapproval in the Senate, which would have uh, stripped the FCC of its ability to regulate the internet uh, for the public interest, uh, and would have handed over control of the internet and our online speech to companies like AT&T and Comcast and Verizon. And thankfully, um, that resolution was voted down. I won't go into the the arcana of, of the FCC process that preceded it. Um, we may get into that at some point, um, but it was a big victory for us. And what it means is that it solidifies some rules that were passed by the FCC back in December of 2010 that aren't actually that great, um, but are better than nothing. And, and a lot of our work going forward is going to be about strengthening those rules. Sure. So does anyone out there have any questions? Um, well, I can, uh, I'll sort of keep going, like, what about, so what about on your phone? Like, is this, like, this is like a, an issue on your phone as well as just not, not just on your, well, your desktop? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tie into that, and, and I hope we get some questions. Um, when I was doing the film, I, I didn't come into this as an activist on the issue. I was actually making a completely different film about brick and mortar and how we lose brick and mortar, what happens to community. I was actually, this ties into what we were saying earlier, but it, it's funny to me. I, I was following Russ Solomon who did Tower Records and I had worked at Tower as a kid and I hung out at record stores and I thought, oh, what happens to community when you don't have a place to go and hang out and exchange ideas and meet your friends? And maybe the internet provides us with these great opportunities for a much wider expanse of information, but at the same token, we kind of lose a locality that's very important to get to know our neighbors and become involved. So that was really where I was at with the film. And I ended up at an FCC hearing thinking I was gonna learn about piracy, and it was Rob's FCC hearing and 12 hours of watching that and, and learning IC, uh, you know, ISP, TCP, reset, messaging and whatever all the lingo was, I did start understanding that this is something that is important to all of us. Not, I'd like to say, oh, in the creative world, but actually it, it's important to all of us in our day-to-day -day communication rights. And something we very much as Americans, I think, take for granted and I think is important to think about. So where is it now? One of my interesting interviews and we didn't use that, but it was with the guy that was with Business Week. And he was like, as long as this isn't something that becomes of public interest, and as long as it doesn't get voted on, unfortunately, you know, our elected representatives 
are what is viewed as the little people. He's like, as long as nobody makes a stink about it, it's going to stay and it's going to go in the favor of the telco, I, you know, telco industry just because nobody wants to regulate it. So I think it's really important that we all think about where our rights are and how we should engage. And, and perhaps even if it seems something that we, of course, we should have rights. But it's not that simple. We need to activate and make some noise and think about it and talk to people and just get the discussion going. And I think these people have all been really great about that. So I just want to kind of do my best to ramble into that. <laughs> I'm long-winded. It's, it's probably 10 minutes too long. <laughs> well, if I, if, if I could kind of Please, build up, save me up from out. myself. Well, no, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic framing. And I think, I think that that's really, to me, that kind of uh, reveals what is, is the most central concern and sort of cause for alarm about this, uh, this issue is that there's a tendency for people to look at, at the kinds of issues that you saw in the film and think, wow, that's really technical, it's really complicated, the best thing for me to do is probably sit back and sort of see how things play out. And um, you know, just to go back to the sort of the metaphor that I started with, like if we took that sort of perspective towards water quality or towards air quality, that would be really bad in the long run. If we sort of said, yeah, let's let's just let business sort out what's the best way to deliver water. And like if it's better for the water company to, you know, to just put water that's only suitable for washing my car but not drinking through the pipes because it's in their business interest, it'll all shake out in the long run. I mean that's disastrous, right? And I think that it's really getting to the point where like the, in, the internet is the infrastructure we rely on for information to flow in society. And if we allow ourselves to fall into that trap of thinking about it as just something for the techies to worry about, then like the techies that are paid by Comcast and by, you know, by these heavily moneyed interests, those are the techies that are gonna be making decisions for us. A uh, question, actually. Um, <clears throat> because when I, when I talk to people about this who are not you know, who, who are, I would say, standard internet users, not, you know, high level internet users. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, or when I talk to my mom about it, which is usually my litmus test and everything, um, she's like, okay, that's cool, you know, why is that an issue? Um, and, and, I, and I think that there's, there is like a disconnect. And, I, and I'm wondering, like, to what degree is this a, a branding issue? I don't know, is it, is it just that net neutrality is such a, um, a distant concept with such a boring name. Like it's, you know, we're standing up here and we're saying, we're gonna fight for neutrality. That's kind of an interesting thing. We're saying, I had an occasion to meet with uh, Senator- Like fighting for beige. Right, exactly. A couple years ago, <laughs> so I'm, I'm part of the Writers Guild, and the Writers Guild set up this meeting with Guild members and Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. And that's the first question I asked her. I'm like, well, what, you know, where do you stand on neutrality? And this was before any of the FCC uh, rulings. And her, her, her whole thing was, and she's since um, come out you know, pretty much in favor, but her whole thing was, uh, I don't know, I mean, you know, uh, status quo, as I understand it, is okay, so we're gonna go with that. I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's fine, but maybe, maybe it's just a case of, you know, we need a more exciting name or something. Like we need a, like a, a more of a, uh, a thing that people, I hate to say it, on Main Street can identify with rather than just Neutrality. I know when uh, when the telecom people got together and said, "Well, we want to, you know, we want to put out a website that talks about this issue," and says, uh, "You know, what they're fighting for is we don't want the government, we don't want the FCC to regulate this." So when they got together and made a website, they called it "Hands Off My Internet," which is like, "That was you know, Cruz. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's like that's like standard. You know, that's that's you know, Cheneyism, like like fear based branding, and it, it works like gangbusters. I would, I would interject there that what you're introducing is, is the, the difference between grassroots and, and astroturf. Right. And yeah, they might have had a catchy name and a ca catchy URL, but nobody gave a shit about that except for the telecom industry, which is paying their hands and to, to produce that website. Right. And, and, and something that that's, when you're talking about this issue that you always have to remember is that you are battling the company, the most powerful companies in the country. These are the companies that donate more money to political campaigns than almost any other co company, including the oil industry and the energy industry. Um, these are companies that pay hundreds of millions of dollars to lobbyists and, and to consulting firms 
to make sure that the policies that they want enacted are enacted. Um, so that includes catchy URLs and, and catchy websites, but nobody's actually behind them. Um, no, but no one goes to and, them. And no yeah. one goes to them. And the, the opposition to that is, you know, I'm not tuning my own horn. There's a lot of other, other groups out there, but there are groups like ours who created SaveTheInternet.com, which includes more than two million people um, who have come out and supported net neutrality and in opposition to all of these things that the telecoms are trying to do. Um, so you have, it's, there's a huge disparity there between these giant companies who are trying to gin up support and there's not actually support there and the actual support that's coming organically. Yeah, I guess, I guess my only point is that, uh, that people are, you say it's a free speech issue and everyone is, is immediately understands that and is rapid to defend it, but that's not the dialogue we hear coming out of it. You know, for, from Washington, so it's more because, like, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we reach people who, who don't have the the, the wherewithal to be actively investigating the issue? Well, like, you know, my, I mean, for my own part, I try to break it down. You know, it's and and first of all, getting away from the the words that no one understands. Like seriously, and sitting in that FCC hearing, I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know. ISP, Internet Service Provider. Everyone's like ISP, ISP, ISP. Most people, that's like one of those things people say, and I'm going to bet half the room has, maybe this room does, but a lot of rooms, they don't know what ISP means. My mom doesn't know what ISP means. I didn't know what ISP means. But you don't want to ask because you're sitting in this hearing and it's ISP, P to P, peer to peer. Okay, what, what the fuck does that mean? And it's like TCP reset message. Nutella, they were blocking Nutella. I think Nutella, I think delicious yeah. hazelnut yeah. spread. I don't think like, oh, that's a protocol. What the fuck is a protocol? Like, that's something you do. Like, all these words, but I, I do believe, and, and I, I went to Hands Off the Internet. That's where we interviewed Michael Curry. Right. And I, I do believe that part of the lingo is part of the problem. I think it's, it's utilized to make people bored so they walk away. Okay. Even the word issue is boring. Like exactly. it's it's an important. It's the biggest weapon we right. have. It's the best weapon is that it's yeah. so confusing boring and boring and confusing yeah. and yeah. techy. The overriding message is do not get involved. <laughs> right. Because who the hell wants smart to people are looking at yeah, these Yeah. Don't days. worry about so it. So I don't know and, and, the answer. I think it's breaking it down. I don't know. Does anybody out there? Come on. Do you all know? TCP, ICP, reset. Okay. Yeah. But I would argue that you don't sure. know PCP, ICP, but, TCP. What were you going to say? The, the rap group that wears clown makeup. <laughs> right, right? Like the same clown posses. Like TCP, a MIP, reset, donkey, <laughs> ENET. But you, like know, what you do know, what you do know is, is not being able to access something that you, you think you should be able to access or not being able to put a message. But I didn't know. Now we're talking to each other. I mean, the whole common <laughs> carriage thing that set me. Well, right was, there, I mean, was there a question? It's not fully. Question. That's all right. <laughs> We're not fully answers, formed so. people. Um, I'm speaking for myself. So, in my work, I'm working with um, a lot of nonprofit organizations, specifically in the U.S., but you know, wider than that. But net neutrality is one of the few things that we as an organization have taken on as an issue okay. um, to support. And the, the the murky version of the water that we deal with is that you know, a nonprofits are already predisposed to fear something related to legislative action for fear that they're going to overstep their legal bounds. Um, but secondly, that they, when they try and understand this, this weird, like super boring, super jargony thing, the only thing they can really understand is, oh, this is going to hurt if we are a hyper advocacy organization. And by and large, you know, at least half of the organizations in the U.S. are not Advocacy. And so they just walk away saying, like, oh, it's not actually affecting us. Like, our text messages to our constituents aren't going to get affected, whatever that is. So then they walk away. So how, how you know, at the end of the day, I've lost hope trying to take responsibility for translating the message of net neutrality to individuals. Like, I'm going to go to the organizations and have them share a message that's relevant to their constituents. But then we lose them at the organizational level because either they're scared of getting involved or they only interpret it as an advocacy issue. So like, how do I retranslate that? I, I understand and it's funny that the international, I, I, I've discussed this earlier, it's been really funny, funny is not the right word, but we've been invited to play a lot of festivals in Eastern Europe and Africa where there are people that culturally understand 
government restrictions on communication issues and, and, and other places in the Middle East where we've been invited to play. And, and it's really in the States that it's been harder to communicate. No, 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 you don't really have. And that's why we really kind of dialed it back to the, and, and doing that whole common carriage sequence was like, nope, too many words. we got to back it down because I was shocked to understand my rights that, that I just take for granted. And I, I really do think that it's kind of just basically communicating to people that your basic communication rights are not protected anymore. And it's protected. Instead of using the word regulated, maybe is the better word, you aren't protected at all by, by, by current law. And, and laws should exist even when you don't want big government, which is people are scared of. But you well, especially government. when the playing field is so complex. That's where regulation becomes important. When, when an organization you know, like Comcast or like any ISP has the ability to do something that's so subtle that it takes, a ne it, like, talk about a perfect storm, right? A guy who's a network engineer who happens to be interested in stuff that is not protected by copyright and who happens to, like, take the steps to figure it out, like, you know, that's where you have danger is when it's possible for, that, for, for a company to, to take steps that no one would ever detect, you know? And then even when someone does detect it. You saw the uphill battle the guy had to ever be able to do anything about that, fighting against like the waves and waves of, uh, of you know, of messages that, that, that came at him, not to mention his own like personal battles. Like that, that's why it's important is like if, if, it, if it was, if it was simple, if it was as simple as all of our sort of shared belief as Americans that free speech is something that our country is founded on and that it's just something that we all agree on. If it was that simple, we wouldn't need to regulate it. But when there are places for like for for moneyed interests to get sort of wedge their way in and increase their profits massively by making one little tweak that they just sort of hope that people don't notice, that's where you need some kind of some some rules to keep the playing field level. Can I just speak to this nonprofit because I know what you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, you. Hi. <laughs> Um, what do you work for? I work for NTAD, the Nonprofit Technology Network. Okay. You, I'm just curious because I'm, I'm get, I, I know that you spend a lot of time convincing nonprofits to use online tools because, and, and to show them why it's important for them to use them. And a reminder that these things wouldn't be so accessible to them and so useful if there were uh, companies getting in the way of you using them um, so freely. Um, that would especially appeal probably to people who are worried about fundraising. Or, you know, I know a lot of nonprofits are saying, like, how can we use Twitter to fundraise or whatever? And <laughs> you don't want to tell them the truth, which, which is, you can't. No, I'm joking, but like. Um, <laughs> no, we had a couple of uh, state attorney generals do a couple webinars about what you need to do to be legal and how to fundraise. And they were very much like, you know, we have a lot of backlash about fear. There's a lot of fear, and there's a lot, you know, it, they're, they're like conservative in the sense that they don't want to try risky stuff if they feel like it's going to risk their reputation and it's going to risk their, their fundraising status, et cetera. But the stuff that they know that they need to do involving the internet is all stuff that exists because of net neutrality. And without it, um, that access to all kinds of potential supporters and donors is, is not going to be there. Oh, you. The bartender has a question. Yeah. So, what can we do as average individuals, maybe who aren't as tech savvy and don't know the height of the political process or anything? What can we do to raise awareness just in our everyday life? Oh, a simple way, something simple. Talk about it with your friends so they become aware, and then when legislation, like just just push back. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, just. Email your Congress or Senator or Congresswoman. Actually, Marsha Blackburn only likes being referred to as a Congressman. So that's why I stumbled on that. But <laughs> she does. She's here's an example. I mean, here, here's a concrete example. I live in Massachusetts. And um, we were lobbying Scott Brown very hard for uh, this last vote. And I, I paid a visit to his uh, offices in Boston. Uh, our DC staff were visiting his offices in Washington, we delivered thousands of, of petitions to his office. Um, we did everything we could to, to get this message to him. And in the end, he did not vote with us. We didn't really expect him to. But it was kind of fascinating that we even got to a point where we thought that he might, because he's 
unfortunately, this this has recently been falling along party lines, and he's a Republican. Um, it, it should not be a partisan issue. Um, and but what's what's interesting is that he released a statement after after the vote where he said, "I agree with the the, the concept of open of the open internet." But I don't think that the FCC should be given the authority to do this, which which has actually been disproven in the Supreme Court. But what what that showed to me is that all of this direct action from his constituents has some sort of effect on him. And and so what you can do is to get to know this issue as it relates to to your elected officials in your state. Um, and it, you know this stuff flows through Congress, so you've got to get to know who your member of Congress is, who your senators are, and where they stand on this particular issue, and then find every avenue possible to communicate to them that they need to do the right thing on it. I have sort of a, a, a different kind of approach, which I mean, all of this is, is excellent, but I think another direction that you can take uh, is use the internet for all it's worth. Just in your like in your day-to-day -day life, be mindful of, of how you're using it. Where are you going for your, and I'm sure that you already do to some degree, but you know, like nurture those instincts within yourself and within your communities of caring about where the information you consume is coming from on the internet and how you're conducting yourself on the internet. The internet was designed as a, an interactive space. So I mean, I, I you know, I uh, so the bias that I bring to this is is as someone who's been heavily engaged on Wikipedia for uh, I don't know six seven years at this point. To me, it's really important that Wikipedia exists. Okay, there was there was a there's a, a, new, a news article in the Associated Press that ran in a bunch of newspapers in 2001, uh, the the year that Wikipedia was born, uh, and the headline of the article was "Internet comes of age and goes commercial." And at that time, it was basically see, like the, the the article was basically an overview of like here's this platform that has all this potential for people to interact and to sort of break open the, the, the media dominance of information. But unfortunately, you know, basically AOL just bought Time Warner and you know, all this stuff. And there are a few little promising projects out there and it named Wikipedia, right? But it basically treated it as a foregone conclusion and that's kind of how it looked in 2001. In 2011, Wikipedia is a top five website. There's no other non-profit website. <laughs> Down there. But it's still it's still vitally important because there is no other nonprofit driven website in I think the top twenty five. I mean we've got like we've sort of wedged in there and and we have this alternative to completely corporate produced information. But if we don't use it, if we're not actively engaging in it, if we're not like figuring out how to contribute to that process ourselves or in our communities or the things like that, we can kind of kiss a goodbye because it's not gonna be able to withstand the onslaught of, of money interest. It's like the web version of eating locally, right? Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, and that goes back locally. to the original thing I was trying to make film about is community. And I think if you're, I hate the word creative community, but if you're a writer or a filmmaker or an artist in that respect, you have to really defend the ground you have left to be able to present your work. And, or at least to have people look at what you're doing. And, and, and that's okay, you know, we, we all can be in garages again. But the internet has also given us a great forum that we can communicate with each other. It's also democratized news and speech and all sorts of, all sorts of fascinating forms of communication if you really think of what we're doing. So I think it's about community and recognizing your value as a member of a steward of that community and really just taking an extra five minutes to do something to make sure everybody gets something from it and everyone has access to it. It's important. Right. Well, oh, yes. You know, you're talking about the comp it's difficult to understand the concepts, but I'll give you a metaphor for, you know, the original thing of the Comcast resets. <clears throat> that if you imagine that there's a, a banquet, a, a buffet of food, and there's a certain number of plates, well, Doxis 1.0, which is what uh, Comcast was using, has a limitation on the number of plates. Uh, uh, BitTorrent is a thing which takes as many plates as it can, you know, regardless of the amount of food that's going on. So the, this was a perfect storm of, you know, that the, the Comcast used what could be argued to be reasonable network management to restrict the number of plates that any, any one person could grab at any one time. And, uh, and people still could connect, but they only with a very limited number of connections through any individual BitTorrent 
thing. So it wasn't so that egregious. As is said in the film, what they did afterwards was egregious. But that isn't, isn't a really serious example of people, of, of people, you know, of censorship or anything on the net. At the same time, the, um, the second example, the SMS example, well, that's not internet. That was them blocking text messages. That's not internet. And then the third example, Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam, there was someone, the content provider, just bleeping out something. That isn't network management or anything, anything to do. So all the examples they use are used and in the film to justify net neutrality, however valid the concept of net neutrality are, aren't but and the guy, the lobbyist who made the point that, you know, the grades and science point. But, but there are egregious incidents in, in showing examples of what can happen, and although you might say that what happened with the torrent isn't a, a huge egregious incident, it is somebody being able to discover, I mean, if it wasn't for, in my world, Rob, but being able to, to figure out that he was being artificially disconnected, uh, we wouldn't know this, and we as average consumers don't have, or myself as an average consumer, don't have the technical skills to sniff and track these kinds of things. Now, the text messaging example is, in fact, not part of neutrality, but it is showing a great and grave problem within the legal rights that exist within the telco situation with our wireless, that they, they do have uh, a right to censor what we send out over text, and we have but no way These to are First Amendment issues not, rather than that. Yeah, yeah. I respond to a couple yeah. of those things. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, speaking about Comcast and, and blocking BitTorrent, um, the, the, the reason why that was an issue was that it was blocking a specific application, and that, um, it, that, that was defined as not reasonable network management. And, any net, uh, it, was a rogue, it was a rogue application in TCP turns on top system. It's, it wasn't it wasn't a rogue application in the sense that like he was downloading the way that we understand that neutrality is that um, it was all two torn. things it was so, grabbing everybody people nobody else could connect because it was grabbing all the TCP connections no it was grabbing bit torn. It, was, it was specifically well, out there shooting down bit torn. so because they didn't like reasonable bit network network management Sorry. means that mm -hmm. when there is a load on the network <laughs> that re the, the reasonable way to manage that that, that load is to uh, slow things down across the board in an equal way, in an equitable way, so that not once, hold on, <laughs> not, not one specific application or one specific website is being affected, right? Everybody's being affected across the board, whatever, it's five o'clock right now and everybody's suddenly on Facebook, everything is being managed equally across the board, not one specific application. So in this case, it was one specific application, it was BitTorrent, and, and so, and then number two is that, um, this applies to legal content, right? So it was BitTorrent being used to download legal content. So Comcast was, was, was both breaking, breaking the notion of, of net neutrality by focusing on one application and then using an argument which is often used towards illegal content for, uh, to target legal content. So, th so th those were the two problems going on with that specific incident. I'm still going. Um, <laughs> With, with, with the blocking of the text messages, you're right that that's not specifically net neutrality because those weren't traveling over the internet. But there's two things that, that are problematic there. One, it's showing that Verizon Wireless, which is in control of, of wireless internet traffic, is willing to block content that it doesn't like. And it also shows that SMS traffic lives in a gray area where it comes to free speech, where there is no regulation that governs what is texted. So um, that points actually to a another problem where we need to figure out what our rights are as mobile users. And I hope we can get to that at some point. The third thing about Pearl Jam is that AT&T was actually broadcasting now on online. And so AT&T, the ISP, was the one who was, in who was doing the censoring in that case. No, they actually weren't. It was the, 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 the truck, the, the people that were actually providing that for oh, AT&T. So. Took, took same, same company, but different. They claim different responsibility. They claim responsibility. The, 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 the webcast is an AT&T web, webcast. I, I know, but and I agree that the AT&T was kind of identified that that they shouldn't have had the ability to do that. And it's just a good example of looking at within the realm of technology what is possible where we're at, and that we need to be a little more aware so that we don't let that fall into worse players than. I'm going to go back and pull, oh, pull you up on the on the on the that first point about the original thing because well actually I I do feel like no no we should keep going yeah let me say this because 
<laughs> Same That's as all right. TC I'm not going to stop you. TC TCP is designed by Vincent from Bob Kahn. It was expected one or two connections per per application. It didn't anticipate BitTorrent, which was something that would come along and demand as many uh, as many connections as it could get at one time. It was like I'm saying, it would take every plate at the buffet and nobody else could get food. Although there's all this food on the table, so I'm saying there isn't, they haven't run out of food, which is what you would be putting to the No, they were sending artificial, see, this is where I should just go get my phone and call Rob, because he can <laughs> fully explain how he's done this and he's, he's very helpful. But it, it is that they were specifically attacking BitTorrent. They, yes. And they uh, were specifically... They were sending resets on, on, on the Artificial connections resets. Because, because artificial are resets. Are you using BitTorrent? Yes. Because, yes. Because, because it was DOCSIS-1 was a thing. How DOCSIS-1, which is the system they use for cable, gave you only a very limited... Your whole neighborhood only had, you know, something like five connections a house. But so it, did, it didn't matter all, about the time. It didn't matter the time so, of day. So, the so, traffic. so, the, so the, tra the amount of traffic didn't make any difference. It was the number of connections that, no, that was it, going on that is, that is actual. We should actual. probably take this. That's a technical yeah, point. No, 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 I don't, don't want to see my okay, no, well, so I do and, know for a fact that the, the tests were done during different intervental times of the day, and it didn't really matter about the traffic exchange. It, it was specifically the torrent that they were attacking. Right. And it could have been any time of day, it didn't matter right. whether or not there was heavy traffic. So what, what the issue then becomes is that an ISP shouldn't have the ability to specifically target a protocol because they don't like it. No, well, I think that's I think that the totally point. Like, no, 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 if, I'm here. If, I mean, that, 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 there is, that there is some genuine complexity in here in the sense that the specific protocol is something that was it, was it was it was acting in a way that was different than how the network was managed. So there there is some like like there there there's some, I think going back to what you said as far as like the original act, you know, and as Rob said, the original act was not something that was so egregious. But he said I mean, it wasn't evil. It, was, was, was his expression? Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. And he but just if, but if I, can, I just I just want to like I think that I think that what you said really points to something that's that's an important piece here, which is that it's the it's the. The, the aspects that are really important about this are the editorial decisions about how information is managed, and and that that ultimately, um, like there need to be some principles around how information is going to be delivered. I mean, I think that like the the common carrier notion of not looking in the envelope and making a an evaluation of the quality of, the, of, of like what is being said in the letter before yeah. deciding whether yeah. or not to Absolutely. deliver it. Absolutely. That's the thing that that that. You know that really needs to drive this sort of system, and and like that's the thing that I think as advocates we all need to see past the, you know the the the, the questions of technology, like understand them, but see past it to that like is like is the way that the technology is being discussed or deployed being done to sort of cover up or justify editorial judgments that don't comply with how we see. And, and I'm going to answer this just because I think it's also where you're hitting with the, they weren't evil. I mean, and, and we can't have all of Rob's weeks of interviews. But he, he was very sincere in that when he found this discovery, he did contact Comcast and, and try very hard to go through their customer service because he thought clearly they don't understand that this is happening and maybe they bought this software in an attempt to do some network management, but obviously it's doing something otherwise than they think it's doing. And this was at a time in Rob's life when he was ill, so he was up at weird hours and kind of doing a lot of testing and a lot of things, but he didn't think they were being evil or bad, and it's never been the attack. And that's not the premise of the discussion on the film. It's, it's more that, well, for Rob's case, he found they, they completely dismissed him and never returned any of his phone calls. And then he got grievously ill and woke up and everything kind of blew up around him and he stood up and, and stayed with the fight. But I, I do think it has more to do with the fact that people shouldn't have, players shouldn't have the ability to do something that can be corrupted. And it's not necessarily that they were doing something in a contemptuous or evil fashion, but it is something that has dangerous parameters around it. And so thus that should be removed so that it's not used in an, in a, an incorrect way in the future. And that, that 
we all preserve our speech rights. Well, that's it. I, think, I really think he made a really good film. I really think it's a great film. It's a great film about him and, and what went through. I think that as far as net neutrality goes, I could, I could pick some holes in it in terms of it, you know, explaining, <coughs> explaining, which is what I was trying to do there. And that's why I asked earlier about Tim Wu. It's Tim Wu's basis where he came up with the thing in the first place, which he said, look at films. Films was originally one-to-one, -one, and then it became this big vertical industry. Look at radio. It was originally one-to-one, -one, then it became a big, you know, vertical industry. Is there any reason to think, you know, that, that uh, the internet won't go the same way? You know, which I think it was a very powerful argument, and it was what got everybody going, as you know, in the first place. And and I still say that, you know, I had this discussion earlier about, you know, you still you want common carriage, but you're still on the on the the same provider. You've got all still got all your eggs in the one basket, and there's only something like structural separation, so that where you can let one company puts the wire in your house, and then you can choose what company provides you with what goes down that wire, or not doesn't have to be the same company that gives you the wire is, is only is ultimately the solution that we can go for and lastly i'll say that right now we have things like protect ip sopa people blocking domain names the government messing with which are which are big issues which are almost trumping trumping this and even finally if you watch the debate yesterday in the in the senate you know rockefeller saying as his conclusion was that the net neutrality rules really are very light and that the Republicans shouldn't get their knickers in a twist, and that the company, the, the business needed business certainty so they could invest and make more jobs. And that was, well, you know, the conclusion where everybody voted and said yes. And I think the most important thing is that we're having a discussion, and that ties into what people And I think the movie, that's, that's the most valuable thing the movie can do is create. Is to get everyone talking, yeah. and that's all I can hope for. All right. Well, thank you, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Sorry to talk too much.